My name is Paul Eisenhower. I'm the executive director and curator at the Wharton Escherich Museum. We are outside of Paoli, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is the home and studio of Wharton Escherich, the sculptor, uh, furniture maker. I guess he's best known as kind of the founder of modern American studio furniture. But he was a modernist sculptor who began life trying to be a painter and evolved into sculpting and discovered that he loved to work in wood and anything with form could be sculpture. So he, he made functional sculpture. As he said, some of my sculpture turned out to be furniture, but he really bridged the gap between arts and crafts. Um, never really considered himself a craftsman, but considered himself an artist. When he gave up painting and started sculpting, he built a studio that was large enough to sculpt in. That was in 1926, and uh, he kept adding on until, until his death in 1970. It's a wonderfully personal building, a statement, uh, a true artist statement of, uh, of what he did. He, he called the building his, his autobiography, but you can see his evolution as an arts and, in the arts and crafts movement of the 19th century through Cubism and Expressionism and other movements of the early 20th century into the kind of lyrical freeform modernist curving furniture that he's best known for, which he did mostly in the 50s and 60s. Before Wharton died, the, his family agreed to keep his collection here at his home together, so it was never sold off. So when you come to the museum, you get to walk into the world that he created and that he lived in. So the furniture, the sculpture, the arrangement of things are all pretty much the way they were when he lived and worked here. And also, we want people to be able to touch the work because part of, part of wood in general, but especially Wharton's work, is the, is the tactile side of it. And if you don't feel what he's doing, you miss a big part of what he's about. When Wharton started making furniture, there was not much of a market for one-of-a-kind art pieces. And indeed, the, you know, the, the arts and crafts movement, the furniture that Green and Green and Stickley and the others were producing, um, though they used craftsmen to make the pieces, they were still following particular forms. They had catalogs, books you would... So most of the art furniture of that era was much like that, or it was different variations on the, the classical furniture design that you would find. Escherich started doing arts and crafts kind of work, um, very influenced by the Rose Valley craftsmen, uh, which are nearby his studio. But really, as an artist, was paying attention to all of the movements that were happening around him. And he felt that he was a good sculptor because he had never been trained as a sculptor. He, uh, he was trained as a painter and he never found his voice as a painter. But as a sculptor, he didn't have anything telling him not to do something. So he was trying to lead a different kind of life out here. And he found he really enjoyed the farmers who lived around him. Uh, he admired their ingenuity. Because you know, to be a farmer, you have to be able to do everything. Um, you, you can't really rely and you don't make enough money to pay other people to help you. Um, so you really have to rely on your wits. And he, he loved what he learned from them. So he would take their ideas and use them to make art. And he, he really liked the idea of functional art. Um, he often said, just because something's beautiful doesn't mean it can't be useful. And so he would take, for example, the door latches here are classic colonial style cabin door latches, uh, but he sculpts them and makes it a beautiful form. So it, it works well, but it also is, is lovely to look at. It was in the 30s when he first started making that leap and realizing that he wasn't making furniture to give him money to be able to make art. The furniture was art, and that, that dichotomy between art and craft was a false dichotomy. And so after he starts, he produces a wonderful series of cubist pieces in the 1930s and then starts working with other 
uh, expressionist forms, um, culminating in the Curtis Bach House, which was probably his, his largest and one of his finest collaborations. And after the Bach House, he was invited to do a room at the 1940 World's Fair. So they, George Howell designed the Pennsylvania Hill House, which was all Wharton's work. So he really created something new. And of course, he's doing all of this in a time when there, when there aren't, there isn't a market for it, so to speak. He's, he's getting his commissions by word of mouth. Um, he's working at this point pretty much with incredibly wealthy people because they were the only ones who could afford to pay him what it cost him to make to make the stuff. And even then, he was not being paid enough. He lived very close to, to the poverty line, which he never felt that way, <laughs> I, sh I should point out. Um, but if you look at income that he made, it was, it was not high. So by the 1940s, he, he has established himself as a furniture maker, as a maker of functional art. He's getting recognition from around the world. Uh, people are coming to see and to learn. And it's in the 40s and then in the 50s that other folks like Wendell Castle um, discover his work and are inspired by it and pursue similar paths. I think Wharton was operating in that realm where he appreciated the consumer and the role that they could play in the process. Um, and at times working with his clients would push him to do things in ways that he hadn't thought of and give him new ideas and take him different places than where he, where he started out. And I think it was the act of creating that, that gave him great pleasure, um, made him what he is. By the 1940s, Wharton was you know, in his 50s. Um, he, was, he was getting to be an old man at this. And when they had the Asilomar Conference in California, Wharton was an old man, was the grand old man um, at the conference, and everyone was somewhat scared and intimidated of him, by him, um, but also admired and respected what he had done. So he, he really paved the way and helped create the market that let that next generation of furniture makers have, have some foundation to build from. And of course, they took things in a direction that I don't think Wharton would have ever dreamed of. And, uh, and I think if he saw it, he would be thrilled that, that it went all the places it went. Um, he hated when people tried to imitate him, but he loved it when he could inspire people to find their own voice and do their own thing. So, and that's what, that's what you see in the modern studio furniture movement, is people following lots of different voices. And uh, Wharton helped break the rules to get that started.